Welcome back everyone to the Dion Training channel and in this video we're going to be talking about something super important which is the OSI model. Now if you're preparing for the CompTIA Network Plus exam or for example the Cisco CCNA exam or you're just trying to get better at networking in general this is going to be super crucial for you. Now don't get scared I know it sounds like robot language but I'm going to explain it in a super easy way and we're going to go through everything about the OSI model that you need to know for any of those exams. Let's get into it. OSI in the OSI model stands for Open Systems Interconnection. The OSI model is like a seven story factory. Each story is its own department and does its own job and they all work together to get your message from its source to its destination safely and correctly. It's actually the model that helps our computers and devices talk to each other even though they're made by different companies or exist in different countries. Exactly like people use rules in order to make conversations, computers do that too. All right, let's break down those seven layers of the OSI model to help you understand it better. Just imagine that you're sending a gift to a friend who lives in another city. That works exactly like the OSI model works when you're sending data across the internet. Let's get right into it. Starting off at layer number one, which is the physical layer. The physical layer, also known as layer number one of the OSI model, is the muscle of the model. It doesn't read or understand the messages. It simply moves the data from one place to another. This data is made up of bits or ones and zeros, as you might know, which then get turned into signals, whether electrical signals or light pulses, and then travels through physical media. This layer is responsible for taking those zeros and ones and turning them into something that can actually be transmitted through the physical parts of our networks, depending on the type of media that your network is using. That could be copper wire cables, fiber optic cables, or simply the air for wireless connections. Think of it just like Morse code. It flashes the data from one part of the network onto the other. All of the physical stuff that you can actually touch in the network belong to the physical layer. So the routers, the network interface cards, ethernet jacks, everything. In fact, this is the only part of the OSI model that actually exists and is not just an abstraction. The physical layer also handles stuff like signal strength, voltage levels, and bit rates. It controls how fast the data is sent and for how long it is sent and makes sure that the timing of the signals is correct. This is really important because if the signal is too weak, it could be lost. Or if it's too fast, the receiving device might not be able to keep up with it. So imagine you're playing the all new Call of Duty Black Ops 6. When you press the button to jump, this action is turned into zeros and ones. The physical layer takes those zeros and ones and actually turns them into signals that can be transmitted through the media. These signals are then transmitted and carried all over the world until they reach the game servers. And once they reach the game servers, they are then processed into the jump action that you see. All of this happens in mere fractions of a second, but it's all because layer one is doing its job behind the scenes. But while this layer is extremely important, there are some things that it can do. The the physical layer doesn't check for errors, it doesn't know who's sending or who's receiving, and that's where the next layers come into place. It's only concerned with moving the bits from one place to another through the physical media. Moving on to the second layer of the OSI model, which is the data link layer. The data link layer or layer two of the OSI model is like the traffic controller of the network. After the physical layer does its job, the data link layer makes sure that these bits actually go to the device that they're meant to go to in your local network. It also makes sure that these bits are sent and received in the right order and don't get mixed up. It's a layer that wraps the data in some kind of frames, like an envelope, for example, puts names onto them and and then sends them off onto their way. At this layer, devices use something called a MAC address or a media access control address. Think of the MAC address like an ID or a tag number for each device. Every single device on the network has a unique MAC address. And if for some reason, two devices on the network has the same IP address, these two devices will never have the same MAC address because it's unique for every single device. When data is sent throughout your local network, the data link layer makes sure that this data goes to the correct MAC address. This is how your messages don't go to your neighbor's laptop when they're meant for your laptop just because you're using Wi-Fi. The data link layer also acts like some type of proofreader. It checks if the data arrived correctly using something called error detection. If the data gets messed up during the sending procedure, which can happen because of electrical interference, damaged cables, or messed up devices, this layer can recognize these errors and in some cases it might ask for the data to be sent again. To understand this layer better, imagine that you're sending a note across class. 
the physical layer is your hand moving the note to another student in the class. But the data link layer is what makes sure that this note has the right name on it and goes to the correct student that you want to receive this note. It also makes sure that the message is complete and that the paper doesn't get crumbled on its way so that the receiver can actually read its content. So if the note goes on to the wrong person or is damaged along the way, the data link layer makes sure that this note is resent so that the correct receiver can get the correct note in good shape. So when you're streaming a YouTube video, the data link layer makes sure that the bits coming from YouTube servers are actually going to your device and not every single device on the local network. Just know that layer two or the data link layer is all about device identity, clean delivery, and local communication. On to layer number three, which is the network layer. The network layer or layer number three of the OSI model is like the map for your network. It's like a GPS or a navigator that your network uses. While the data link layer makes sure that the bits or the data goes onto the right device on your local network, the network layer is responsible for moving the data to the correct network if you're communicating with external networks. The network layer, coming from its namesake, figures out how to get data from one network to another network, across the internet and between different countries, for example. It's responsible for the routing process, which means choosing the best route for your data to move through from one part of the network to another part of another network. Instead of MAC addresses, the network layer actually uses something called IP addresses, or or internet protocol addresses. An IP address is like the home address of a device, but it's used on a global scale. It tells the internet where to send your messages, videos, data, images, anything. Every phone, laptop, and server has the specific IP address. So when you send a message, the network layer takes a look at the destination IP address and says, oh, I know where to send that and I know how to get it there, and then guides your data along its route until it actually reaches the correct destination. Let's say you're sending an email to someone who's not in the same country as you are, not even on the same network. The data link layer can move something across your local network, but it can't really move something to another network in a whole nother country. So that's where the network layer comes in. It figures out the best route through different routers and networks in order to get your email from your device or email server onto the email server of your receiver. Kind of like figuring out the best and fastest way to get from your house in New Jersey to your friend's house in Tokyo using planes, trains, and cars. As we said before, the most common protocol used in this layer is the IP or the internet protocol. Now, there are two versions of this, IPv4 and IPv6, which we can dive in in another video if you want to. The network layer breaks the data into packets and attaches the destination IP onto those packets so routers can read it. The routers can then pass it on across networks in order for it to reach the correct destination. So again, like we mentioned before, if you're trying to plan a route from your house onto a friend's house, you do the same thing the network layer does, and then you actually start going through that route. But the network layer doesn't really guarantee that your message actually goes through the route that it decided. It simply figures out the route that it's going to take and then it passes it along. If it gets lost, the network layer can't really do anything about it. Moving on to layer number four, or the transport layer. The transport layer is like the reliable delivery driver that gets you everything you need. When the network layer decides the route, the transport layer actually makes sure that it goes through that route. It also makes sure that the data gets there complete, safe, and in the right order. This layer really cares about the quality of the trip. It's all about reliability and control. Let's say that you're watching a YouTube video or you're sending a huge picture or video to one of your friends. That file is actually too big to send at once. So the transport layer breaks it into smaller pieces that your network can handle and that can be transmitted across the network. These small pieces are called segments. It's like pages of a book. It gives each segment a specific number. So when the other person receives these segments, the transport layer can then rearrange them, put them in the correct order so that your friend can view the video or message or that you can stream that actual YouTube video in the correct order it's being displayed. So if any single segment of those segments gets lost or gets corrupted, the transport layer can ask for it to be resent in order to make sure that the message reaches the destination whole and reliable. The transport layer uses two protocols the UDP protocol and the TCP protocol. TCP or transmission control protocol is the more reliable one. It checks and makes sure that everything and every single segment arrives in an order with a tracking number and requires a signature. This is great for things like emails, web browsing, and file downloads where the order of the data matters very much because even a little small mishap can actually destroy the whole file and make it unusable. UDP or the user datagram protocol on the other hand 
hand is a little less careful. It's super fast, but not so reliable. It just sends out the data without checking the order or if something is corrupt. We use it when speed is more important than reliability. So like in online gaming, video calls, or video streaming, UDP is much better because it's faster. Think about it. If you're viewing a video and one packet gets lost, so it's just one frame from the video that gets lost, you're probably not going to notice. But you will need those packets to arrive in quickly so that you can keep interacting in real time. The transport layer also handles something called port numbers, which helps direct your data to the right port on the device. So if your phone is downloading a video and you're checking an email at the same time, those packets and segments don't actually get mixed up. Port numbers make sure that the video segments go to the video app and the email segments go to the email app. All right, now let's move on to layer number five or the session layer. The session layer or layer number five of the OSI model is like the conversation host of the network. It's responsible for starting, holding, and ending the communication sessions between two devices. A session is just our fancy way of saying a conversation between two devices on the network. Whether you're on a video call, playing an online game, or watching a YouTube video, all of this is considered a conversation between your computer and another computer. The session layer is working quietly in the background to set up the connection keep it alive and then end it once you no longer need it. Let's say you're on a Zoom call. The session layer makes sure that the conversation starts when you click the join button. It makes sure that it's continuing while you hold out your video meeting. And then it makes sure that the session is ended once you click the leave button. And if your connection is lost during this call, the session layer can help reestablish the connection and keep the call going. Another really good example is when you're logging into your email. Once you log in and put your username and password, the session is started between your device and the email server. And throughout the process, while you're reviewing the emails and responding to other emails, the session is kept alive. Then, once you close the application, the session is then ended. The session layer can also keep track of several conversations at the same time. So if you're talking to a friend, browsing your emails, watching a YouTube video all at the same time, the session layer makes sure that these conversations are held separately and correctly. This layer uses something called APIs or application programming interfaces and protocols like RPC or NetBIOS to make sure that these sessions run smoothly effectively and reliably. You don't see this stuff directly, but it's always working under the hood. Next up, we have layer number six, or the presentation layer. The presentation layer is like the translator or the bodyguard in your network. After the session layer sets up the conversation or connection, the presentation layer makes sure that both sides understand each other and can communicate effectively. It's responsible for translating, formatting, compressing, and encrypting so that it can be properly displayed, safely sent, and understood by the receiving device. Imagine two people trying to speak to each other. The first one speaks English and the other one speaks Japanese. Now without a translator, it would be impossible for them to understand each other. The presentation layer does the same things. So for example, if you're trying to send a message or an image to a server, your computer is using a specific format for this image, while the server uses another format. The presentation layer turns this message into a format that can be read and communicated by both sides so that everything shows up correctly on your screen and all the data is sent correctly to the device. It also handles encryption and decryption, which means that your data is turned into a secret code before it's sent out and make sure that it travels safely without anyone snooping in and taking a look at your very precious data. So when you log into a website and you see the little lock on the top left corner of the browser, that says that this website is using HTTPS and the presentation layer is encrypting your data while it's traveling so no hackers could actually snoop into it. The presentation layer also does a little bit of compression. So when you're sending a very big file on the network, it can actually compress that file into a smaller size so that it can be more efficiently sent out through the network. This helps websites load faster and videos run smoother. That's what the presentation layer is all about. Last but not least, we have layer seven or the application layer, which is the layer that you interact with on a daily basis. The application layer or layer seven is the top layer of the OSI model. Even if you've not heard of it before, this is the one that you're most familiar with and you can actually see and use it every single day. It's where your favorite apps and websites and services live like YouTube, Google search, Call of Duty, everything. The application layer is how you, the human, hopefully, and the device interact with the internet. But here's the thing, that doesn't mean that the app is actually the application layer, but the part of the app that interacts with the network is called the application layer. This is the layer where your device says, oh, I need to interact with that web page, or I need to open this certain application. And this is where your computer starts putting one and one together and figures out how to deal with it. The application layer uses something called protocols. The protocols are rules between computers for communication. For example, it uses the HTTP and HTTPS protocol for web browsing, SMTP, 
IMAP and POP3 for sending, receiving, and storing emails, FTP for downloading and sending files, and DNS for translating IP addresses into human readable names and vice versa. So let's say you open a web browser and try to go to a specific website. Your web browser then uses HTTP or HTTPS to actually fetch that data for you to view. All of that is handled at layer seven of the OSI model or the application layer. This layer also helps the apps know how to behave. If you're in a Zoom call, the app needs to know how to start the call, send video and receive video and to end the call when you're done. Those actions rely heavily on the application layer. And there you have it, the OSI model explained thoroughly from layer one, starting at your physical media and couple wires all the way onto the code and applications in layer seven or the application layer. I hope you liked this video. If you liked it, please give the video a thumbs up, comment down below which kind of videos you want to see from the Dion Training channel and I'll see you in the next one.